All right, welcome to Really Scary. Uh, we have just watched a movie. Uh, I am Michael Crediger. This is my lovely wife. Hello. Sorry, I didn't mean to, to, cut, to cut in there on your introduction. <laughs> um, that's not my intention. Um, we've just watched a movie. Uh, what movie did we watch, babe? We watched the new Ghostbusters movie. Mm-hmm. And, um, gotta say, pretty damn good. Yes, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, th I thought it was I thought it was very very good. I, I thought it was a, definitely a nice follow up to Afterlife. Absolutely, they really did a good job. I mean, obviously they brought back all the other characters, but they also managed to do a really nice balance where they brought back the original Ghostbusters, of course, the three who are alive, as well. But it didn't ever feel like they were overshadowing the kids since this is their series now. Yeah, it's. They used them mainly as, like, a source to go to when they needed to, like, kind of uh, ask questions or be like, Hey, I don't know what this thing is. What do you think it is? The old sage. Yeah, exactly. Hello, Elder. What do you, what do you think of this thing I've just found? <laughs> yeah, and I think that worked very well for them, especially for Dan Aykroyd, who is just playing himself in this role. Aykroyd. <laughs> John John Pounds out there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's and we even get to get to see uh, uh, some of um, Bill Murray too. Yeah, which was very nice. It's so good to get to see all three of them. You know, we get to see a little bit of their characters and a little bit of kind of where they are now, which is nice because it's kind of weird to consider something like the Ghostbusters existing in real life and then this whole turnaround of them being you know celebrities and suddenly they've dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah. And I think they did a really good job of expanding on that lore for us while, once again, not really taking too much away from the main story. Mm -hmm. I definitely like uh, what they're doing with the family dynamic as well. Absolutely. They did a really good job at playing up this whole new family dynamic. And most importantly, again, they balanced it with the story. You know, they had some really good moments where we have Paul Rudd out here and he's trying to be the stepdad and he doesn't know and he's kind of back and forth and it's very funny because it's Paul Rudd and it's all very heartfelt and it adds to the story as the conflict builds around this idea of Phoebe being kind of othered within her own family. Yeah, it's a, the story mainly centers around uh, Phoebe for this movie, which it, it kind of did in the first one as well. Yeah, I think it's fair to say Phoebe's the main character, and I'm loving it personally. Yeah, I, th I think Phoebe is definitely a fantastic character to uh, uh, focus on moving forward, especially since within the, the, the lore... The lore of the of the movie, she is uh, Spangler's granddaughter. Yeah, and she's clearly the one who has spiritually taken up that title. Yeah, yeah, which which is uh, funny because I actually was having this conversation with uh, with uh, some of the guys at work today, where she's kind of the only one who they've made as like a replacement for one of the uh, uh, original four Ghostbusters. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, there's not much you can do when one of your Ghostbusters dies. Yeah. I think that they've done a good job of honoring his memory without making it too exploitative. Yeah. But I can definitely see that they kind of made her to replace his character in a way. But again, I think that she really fits well into the role of spiritual successor as well, where she does have little bits and pieces of her personality that are individual. Yeah, yeah. And her actress does a fantastic job as well. Yeah, she is amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. But yeah, bringing it back uh, to the family dynamic, uh, Paul Paul Rudd was definitely a, a great little comic relief for the family. Oh, absolutely. Just like, I, I, I could be an asshole to your kids, just not to you. I'll be nice to you. Just not just not your, 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 your kids. I could be an asshole. Watch! <laughs> I didn't like that. I'm sorry. I will, I'll be an asshole to the kids, <laughs> not you. <laughs> yeah, there's a scene in the movie where where they where they're so it's it's a big uh, a big um, not really a, a huge plot point but one of the plot points of the movie where um, they're trying they're kind of easing into this new dynamic of Paul Rudd's character being uh, their dad and acting as their dad uh, and the, the 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 point that Ash just brought up is uh, there's a, a point in the movie where he's like. Can I discipline your kids? Like, 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 like what, am I overreaching on that? What, 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 what do I do here? 
uh, and in that moment, um, the the mom's character is uh, holding a some some freshly cleaned laundry, and he pulls out one of the one of the, the sheets and throws it on the floor, and then immediately apologizes for it. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a fantastic uh, l- a little moment, and I think that though I just I just love their whole family. Honestly. Yeah. I think they have a really good dynamic. We've got the mom is very funny and she very much plays how I imagine most mothers feel. <laughs> yeah. We've got the older brother who is trying to be an adult and is just being really funny and ridiculous all the time. We have the uh, Phoebe who is just brilliant and is trying to grow up sooner than she is. And then we have Paul Rudd, who is just this amazing good guy dad character. Yeah. Like, that's his typecast now ever since he did Ant-Man, and I am so here for it. Yeah, it's I, I love him in, um, in this role, and honestly, these kinds of roles. Um, I'm always a little hesitant uh, to support uh, actors being typecasted, because I feel like it, they can kind of play the same character over and over. A bit like like, like Chris Evans playing uh, um, Captain America, where it's like, oh, he can only play the good guy now. Um, but but for for the moment where Paul Rudd has this typecast, I actually really do enjoy it because he plays it off very well. Yeah, and I think this actually is a very interesting point for me because I was thinking about, uh, we recently watched the uh, farewell tour of Game Theory and mm, all yeah. the theory videos, and we all very much enjoyed it. And so something that stuck with me was the film theory video where they talk about male role models. And we don't have a lot of good male role models because usually they have flaws in some way or another. And I think what we've accidentally stumbled into is Paul Red. his typecast is a good male role model as an adult. Yeah. He's a kind guy, he's funny, and he's responsible, he's not the mess up kind of guy that just screws up everything. He's a little goofy, but he's reliable. Yeah. And so I think it's really awesome to see him out here consistently getting roles in this field because it's so cool to have someone to point to at this point. Mm -hmm. And if you've seen the film theory video that I'm talking about, you'll understand exactly what I mean. Exactly, yeah. They see something really cool um, in this movie, we've just switching topics here. Mm Um, where they expand a little bit on the history of ghost hunters. In, in, in this movie, getting a little bit into uh, spoiler territory, um, but in this movie, they explain that the Ghostbusters um, are not the first kind of group to, uh, to research ghosts and to, to hunt ghosts. Um, there are, I think they're called the Fire Keepers? Is the Fire Masters. The Fire Masters, yes. There's... Um, there's a new uh, mythos for uh, for a ghost for a, a group of ghost hunters that were kind of in ancient times, and that's where this um, this movie's villain comes into, which we'll get to in a second. Um, they have these fire masters that were uh, that would in that would entrap ghosts in these brass orbs, uh, and they're basically like firebenders. <laughs> They're basically fire vendors, but um, but they, it's it's like an early version of like the Ghostbusters, um, and uh, I love that they are expanding this universe and getting more uh, in depth into ghosts, not just around the Ghostbusters, but the ghosts of this franchise's universe. Yeah, and they managed to tie it into the lore of their own, you know, spirits as well because they miss, they um, point out that people have always been known to, on occasion, have an unexpected gift that can't be explained. And the way they explain it here is they say that it's a manipulation of the same energies that are used to create the corporeal spirits that we know of in the Ghostbusters universe. And so it's really nice for them to not just pop in someone with magic powers, but to actually take the time to explain it and leave it an open door for further expansion. Also, I do have to say it was nice to see the uh, not white people being the savior this time. <laughs> yes, um, it is uh, the the fire catchers are notably. I think I think that they're meant to be Indian. Yeah, they're Indian. Yeah, they're, um, they're meant to be Indian, and um, 
on that same uh, thought process, uh, the main fire catcher of this, or fire master, sorry, fire master of this film is the comic relief. Um, I think his name's Nahim. Is it what it was? I believe so. Yeah, Nahim. Um, they do a fantastic job in this movie of having a comic relief that doesn't feel overdone. Absolutely. So, the last act of this movie, as we're going to be talking about now, there is a lot of stress, tension. There are some very big horror themes in there of, you know, these building up tensions and people freezing to death and all this seriousness. And they manage to bring this dude in to remind you that the movie is a comedy without making it feel like you just got slapped in the face. And it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful balance that they've struck there. Yeah, and his, his actor does a great job at, at being a funny character. Being a funny character without being annoying. Yeah, because he's definitely type, you know, his character is the idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. And he's just kind of like floating through life. He has no idea what's going on around him. But he manages to pull it together enough when it's important. And I think that's what really grounds him as a character is that while he never loses that goofy aspect of his personality, he does seem to understand the gravity of the situation and puts in some real genuine effort to try to contribute and help people. Yeah. And that's kind of um, one of the things that I like about the Ghostbusters franchise because it's, it's not all out horror. You know, it's it's not really a horror franchise. There, they can find scary things in them. A lot of the um, the villains in the uh, in the movies are definitely decently scary, or at least intimidating at the very least. Um, but it's still like it's still a, a family comedy. Like it, it's still something you can take you know kids to see, and they'll have a good job, a good time watching it. Yeah, I feel like this definitely is on the kid-friendly side of the baby horror genre. Yeah. You know, along with the, the Coraline and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Where it's got some themes of it in there, but you're also not going to scare anyone off who is not part of the horror um, fandom. Yeah. But there's a lot, there's way more comedy than Coraline, though. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is something to definitely remember about this, is that it is a comedy. Coraline yes. is legitimately terrifying. That's why I say that Ghostbusters is on the far end of that spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, we talked to some uh, about the things that we liked about the movie, we loved about the movie. Um, now, as we get into the end of the movie, let's transition a little bit into maybe uh, some things that I think we both didn't really enjoy that much about the movie. Um, at least I didn't really like the the final act of it. Because, um, not that it was bad, it was just a little lackluster. It was... The, 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 the villain of the of the movie was built up as this really big ominous character and they do a, the movie does a really good job as portraying him as such but he's kind of defeated rather quickly uh, and we don't really get to see a whole lot of him yeah that is the biggest complaint that we have is that we did not get to see enough of the bad guy but what we saw was amazing. Yeah. And so that's why it's a little frustrating because it's like you see all this cool stuff and he's going around, he's just freezing people, killing people like straight out. And obviously there's going to be a confrontation where the Ghostbusters have to find a way to meet on the gods level. Because that's how this works. They have to defeat the bad guy and stuff like that. But it is a shame that we didn't get to have like a big rampage scene like you would have seen in the original two Ghostbusters movies. Yeah. Yeah, like it just it's just thinking back to the uh, to the original Ghostbusters movie like we had um the the big bad character um that that uh that they fought and then they fought the fucking stay puffed guy. Like the, the we got like basically two villains at the end of that movie and it was it was a longer fight. It, it was it was a longer um, effort uh, to uh, to get those two evils under control in that movie. Um, but it, and as well as the, the second and uh, and afterlife as well. Um, but with this one, it kind of feels like a lot of it. Um, 
a lot of it was kind of saved for the end of the movie. And like, I, th- I think I think I, I said this at the at the um, after we got out of the theater, uh, when I was sitting there watching the movie, uh, a lot of the movie had 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 passed, and um, I was having trouble thinking this was going to be like a three hour movie. So I was like, man, a lot of movie has happened here. How are they going to tie this all over? Are we going into an extended third act? And there was a part of me that was like, okay, is there, is this going to be a two parter? Because again, a lot of a lot of the um, the movie had happened, a lot of uh, uh, stuff had happened, but the, we really hadn't gotten to the main villain uh, yet. And then we get we get to it, and then like I said, everything's just kind of wrapped up very quickly. To be fair, I will give them credit though that there it was a pretty extended fight as far as the traditional Ghostbusters, you know encounter goes you know there were different phases we got to see all of the different um you know mainline ghostbusters um out there doing their own thing and trying their hardest before we got into the real serious confrontation where we finally take him down um i did want to ask though so i'm kind of a ghostbusters casual fan is there a reason why we decided that crossing the beams is not okay anymore because i feel like that that the this might be an op a situation where that would be an option. That is, that is a good point. Like they didn't really bring that up at all in the in this movie because we have of course the, the the famous cross streams scene in the first movie, um, and we get that in Afterlife where they where they cross the streams as well at the end of the movie. That's how they beat you know the big bad from the first movie, but in this movie because. It's a bit of a plot point um, in this movie where the normal proton packs uh, don't affect this movie's villain. Um, he is like some corporeal uh, being that is above regular proton packs. Like someone tries to uh, to shoot him with a proton pack to, to get him stationary, but he freezes the stream. Um, and it's a... A, a big uh, way to combat that is Phoebe um, coats the inside of her proton pack uh, with uh, with brass instead of the regular. I think it was copper they used, um, or it was it was some other metal. Um, but uh, basically, throughout the entire movie, we see the the, the villain inside this brass orb, um, and that's where she gets the idea of what of. Uh, changing the proton pack's design a little bit to be brass based instead of the the metal they were using before and that's how they're able to stop the the, the villain in this movie you stop that stop. that's how we're able to to stop the villain of this movie is she makes that adjustment to a proton pack but no one ever suggests crossing streams yeah, I just wonder why we suddenly decided that, you know, the world ending isn't worth that risk anymore. Because there were a lot of people dying. Uh, people were slowly getting frozen to death. Um, yeah, I just, I want to know why we decided to rule that out as an option. Like, I know that it was a whole thing that it was a big risk and stuff, but the world is ending. You've accidentally unleashed a death god. I feel like you should be taking drastic action. And I think that, and I mean, that's the whole reason why they cross streams in the first movie is, you know, one stream isn't enough. So it's like, why, why did no one say, hey, what if we cross streams? Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, 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 that's a good point. I, I, I never actually thought of that. <laughs> Yeah, I remember thinking about that in the movie. I'm just like, well, like, listen, we've got the original Ghostbusters here. Why aren't they bringing this shit up? Yeah. Oh, and can I talk about my biggest pain point for the end of the movie here? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Why did they not let Phoebe kiss her ghost girlfriend? Come <laughs> on, it was right there. She became a ghost so that she could experience this girl's world and be with her. Why can they not have one kiss? So uh, in this movie, um, they introduce this uh, this ghost character. Um, I forget her name. Melody. 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 That's right. Um, they introduced this uh, this ghost ca- character that's kind of shown to be a little bit on par intellectually with Phoebe because they have a whole moment with with uh, with like them playing chess and Melody actually beats Phoebe at chess, which is like 
the thematic uh, version of saying, oh, they're this character's smarter, or at least a little bit more intelligent, or at least on par with intelligence. And they have the, this, this um, she's, she's kind of like a twist character because she ends up betraying Phoebe at the end. Um, but throughout the movie, we get their interactions, and Phoebe has this, um, this problem th throughout the movie where... She's not really taken uh, super seriously because she's, you know, not uh, an adult yet. She's only 15. Um, and uh, she feels kind of ousted, I think you mentioned earlier, by her, yeah. by her family. Um, and it's this uh, ghost character, Melody, that kind of steps in to kind of comfort her a little bit and, and be that person who's like, hey, I understand you. Um, and there's a, a, another point in this movie uh, later on where they have this uh, this ghost extractor. There's a whole like uh, part of the Ghostbusters that's been, that's been built on top of, and they've uh, improved the technology, and they have uh, an extractor that can extract uh, ghosts from possessed items. Which, also just to say, it is amazing that they are also taking the time to expand the science of the ghosts as well, because it's another one of those things where it's like, yeah, you should expect people to be doing this kind of research now that we know that the ghosts are real. Yeah, exactly. Um, and Phoebe, completely on a theory, because uh, uh, they, they haven't tried uh, separating a human spirit from a human body, completely on a theory decides to step in uh, to this extractor and extract her spirit from her body so she can be on the same plane as Melody so that they can physically interact. Um, and at the end of the movie, uh, 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 Phoebe comes around and she actually helps uh, save the day. But, and they, they have a, um, a moment at the end where they're kind of facing each other um, and, and they're just kind of looking at each other longingly, um, but they don't embrace, they don't, they don't give a little smooch, they don't, they don't do any of that. Um, and you can tell through their interactions through this movie that that's kind of what they're building up, that they were building up to, but they never deliver on that. Yeah, so there was nothing that was explicitly like you could see that they were flirting, flirting, but they had chemistry. All I'm gonna say about that is if uh, Phoebe were a boy, then this would have been explicit and everyone would accept that it is. So if anyone has any complaints out there, I'm not gonna hear it. Um, but I actually, I also thought of something while you were talking about that. Um, do you think our Mr. Death God in this movie can see the future? I don't think there's any explicit explanation that he kind of could. Okay, so then he's taking a really big risk in assuming that one, Phoebe wants to experience being a ghost, and two, they would have the technology to allow for that to happen. That is a good point, because um, also in the movie, uh, the, the the main villain has been kept inside this orb um, and the the comic relief of this movie who ends up being this movie's uh, firemaster his grandmother was the original firemaster that ended up trapping um, this uh, the, the villain inside of this orb and for, and since uh, she trapped him inside this orb which in the movie is said to happen a, a long time ago, like before the original Ghostbusters got together. Um, he's been kept inside this like soundproof uh, brass room, completely locked away from the rest of the world because in the movie it's shown that the, uh, the villain has uh, uh, impact and, and the ability to basically kind of control other ghosts like not not necessarily control the minds of but he has a lot of influence over ghosts over other ghosts so they kept him inside so he was kept inside this uh, the soundproof brass room so he couldn't escape and he couldn't uh reach his voice out to reach other ghosts to try and help him out um so he really would have had no way of knowing that there was this technology or that there was even these new Ghostbusters or who Phoebe was or anything. Yes, but he ended up using Phoebe and the fact that she um, was able to essentially astral project for a while. Yeah. 
the fact that she was able to take her spirit out of her body is the sole reason he got out of that brass ball. Yeah. So it kind of makes no sense unless they're trying to kind of subtly include the fact that he can see the future for him to have any idea that any of this was possible. You know, I, I if, if that was the intention of the filmmakers, I did not get that at all. Um, that he would be able to see the future. Yeah, and also it's... That there's a lot of leaps there because Melody never mentioned becoming a ghost. You know, they had their whole little flirtation thing going on and they were talking and Phoebe was feeling very alone and she wanted to get close to Melody. And Phoebe never once said, I wish you were like me or anything like that. No. In fact, I'm pretty sure that Phoebe was the one who said man, if only we weren't separated by dimensions. And so it doesn't make sense for this to be a bait and switch for Phoebe because Phoebe's the one who came up with the idea in the first place. Yeah. Like, yes, obviously Melody was very much included in the decision because, you know, she wanted to be close to her, be able to physically interact with her. But there's no way in hell they should have known that that's what was going to happen. Yeah, because thinking about it, you know, I could definitely buy, um, like, uh, the villain in this movie once he's taken out of his soundproof prison. I could definitely buy him, like, communicating with the ghosts and getting caught up to speed um, with, uh, with everything that's been going on with the Ghostbusters because he's taken the basically Ghostbusters HQ. So I can definitely buy him getting the information that he needs to, to figure out what's going on in the world. But to make the assumption that Phoebe wants to be a ghost when she's never really uh, expressed that in the entire movie or even the movie prior is kind of a big leap. And he ends up being right in, in terms of the story, but it's, it's, it's a big jump. Yeah, watching. there's a lot of writing on this random whim of this random teenager that he's never physically been able to interact with. Yeah, yeah. And, like, th throughout the movie, we, we do get little hints that um, Phoebe is at least interested in what it's like to be a ghost and what it's like to transition over to being a spirit. Um, but we never get... Excuse me. We never see her express that she would like to become a ghost or or that she feels a need to accelerate becoming a ghost at all because uh there's some there's some weird implications there yeah <laughs> with uh with wanting to to be a ghost and wanting to experience what it's like to be a ghost because you kind of need to you know pass away first yeah, that is a, a bit of a tricky subject. Yeah, because, like, one, one of the things that I love about the, the Ghostbusters uh, franchise is, yes, it, it's it's a paranormal series because they were ghosts, but they always do the best to explain uh, ghosts and how they are and why they are through, through, uh, through sci-fi, through, through science fiction, um, and the science of ghosts. Uh, and that's what Phoebe is uh, is interested by, it, um, is the the feeling of having your your particles kind of uh, freed and having in the feeling of what that might be like. Um, but at the same time, like I said, it's never really explicitly said, "Oh, hey, I want to be a ghost," or "I long for the feeling of what it's like to be a ghost." Because she even comes up and asks Dan Aykroyd, because uh, uh, Dan. Um, Hey, have you ever wondered what it's like to be a ghost? And Dan was like, oh, all the time. Which, kind of thinking back on it, just kind of feels like something that was introduced to make the plot make a little more sense. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's that's what she's uh, she's interested by is, is the whole experience of having your particles freed. Um, but it's it's still a big leap to, to, to think that Phoebe... A scientist who were, who is kind of shown to be at least a, somewhat on par with Spangler, uh, make such a big jump in in the in theorizing that she 
decides to put herself in a chamber to 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 free her spirit from her body because because like i said in when we're introduced to the uh to the machine that uh can separate spirits from the upset the possessed object she asks hey have you ever tried it on a human and they said no my head thought that that would you know come together uh, uh come into play later on in the movie um but i never really expected phoebe again a scientist to go huh it works on inanimate objects she'll work on me yeah and i kind of assumed that, that was a question about you know ghosts possessing humans like we saw in the previous movie with her mother and her new stepfather yeah um i never expected it to be can you separate a person's spirit from their body yeah like like they're like there's no extra spirit in the body it's just that person's spirit also, that does leave some pretty fucked up implications for what happens if someone does get possessed by a ghost, because how the hell are you going to fix that? And, like, if someone is possessed by a ghost, how do you know what spirit you're getting out? Yeah. Are, are, are we getting, like, a like a fly situation? Uh, the, the fly situation with, with spirits? Yeah, because, like, <laughs> they've got this whole machine in it. Specifically, it draws the spirit out, and then it sucks it into a different chamber and then traps it. How are you going to isolate the two? Do they've got they got some sort of like centrifuge somewhere to separate out the spirits from each other so that you can isolate them and figure out which one is the good spirit? Are we gonna have one of those really bad good twin evil twin tropes going on? And that that's also something uh, to bring up is Phoebe, as far as we know, as far as we were shown in the film, has never interacted with this piece of machinery. And yet she was able to use it, for one. And also, for some reason, there's a way to set it where you're only parting the spirit from the object uh, that it was originally possessing for a certain amount of time. And then you're able to reverse the process on a timer. Yeah, that is an interesting function, unless they designed it intentionally for this purpose. Yeah, like maybe human testing later on. Yeah. Because, Which uh, isn't out of the realm of possibility considering no. the types of experiments that they were doing, but of course it's just never explained. Yeah, because the whole reason why they have this machine is um, it's explained uh, in the movie that the that the ghost trap that they, um, that they put, the, the ghost vault I should say, um, that they take ghosts out of and, and uh, keep in the firehouse is getting full and it's at capacity. Um, and, it's ex and it's explained that they have uh, a whole facility with um, a much bigger vault that they've, that, they've, um, that they've created. And it's built in this old uh, aquarium so they can actually put ghosts in um, certain habitats so they can study them further. Um, and the whole reason for this device's existence is to extract the ghost from uh, the possessed object and put it into this vault or put it into these habitats. Um, unless there was some kind of future plans for human testing, I don't understand why there needed to have been the addition of a timer. And again, this was never really uh, showed in any other part of the movie. Um, when, because... Uh, Phoebe brings Melody over to Ghostbusters HQ, knowing that this machine is there so she can separate her, her spirit, and that's how uh, uh, they they trick her um, into letting out this this movie's um, villain. Um, and that is the only moment where we get where it's the timer on this is even mentioned or even used. Because before we just kind of see it separating ghosts from their from their uh, from their objects, there's no real need for a timer. Yeah, because it immediately transfers them into the uh, essentially the jail cell. <laughs> yeah, well, it goes into the second chamber, and I think from there it goes to the jail. Yeah, they've got it's a slightly complicated system. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a complicated system, but I know one thing: there was no mention of a timer before. Definitely. Uh, which is something to, to note. So, I mean, th there are definitely holes in the movie, um, but nothing uh, really brought me out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Everything was believable within, you know, um, suspension of disbelief. 
you know, there are little plot holes and stuff like that that we can poke fun at, but during the movie, we didn't think of any of these things. We were just enjoying the ride. It was funny, it was emotional, there were some really good characters with some really good story beats, and like I've said before, they juggled a lot of things and they managed to give everyone the time they deserve without overwhelming you. Yeah. And that is such an impressive sequel for me. Obviously, it's not the best movie in the world, but what movie really is? Yeah. Although, can I have one more rant before yeah. we start logging off? Is it about the Stay Puft Marshmallow again? Yes, it is. Yeah, I thought okay. so. I thought so. <laughs> I have to bring this up. I need to bring this up. I've never heard anyone talking about this. Okay, I saw the little mini marshmallow guys in uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, and I looked at them, and I am a lover of very cute things. I think my, uh, my lovely husband here can agree. Yes, yes, absolutely. We have two cats, and she loves them dearly. So I looked at these adorable little guys, and no, I did not have stars in my eyes. I looked at them, and I saw the minions. I saw <laughs> merchandise. I saw something that was going to drive me crazy for the next decade. And God was I right. They will not let these little marshmallow guys die. So listen, they were a brief thing in the previous movie that kept coming up for the rest of the plot. And then in this movie, they tell us that Dan Aykroyd has smuggled them back to New York for plot reasons, and they managed to actually use them in a good way. They use them as sort of like the first sign that something is wrong with the brass orb containing the big bad. Yeah. But then they keep coming back. They've got these little fucking suicidal marshmallow men, and... It's funny for a little while, and then they're suddenly in the car with everyone during the big fight scene, and they just pop up and they're not even doing anything. It's just there to remind you that they exist. And then we got an, a mid credit scene, and we were talking about it because there was um, a ghost that was introduced in this movie called The Possessor, and it possesses inanimate objects and it jumps around, and it is... First of all, completely OP because it yes. can just take the form of whatever the hell it wants. Mm -hmm. And so we get to this end credit scene and we see this trucker dude stop at a gas station and suddenly his truck starts moving on its own. And we're like, oh my god, the possessor is free. And then they show the tiny marshmallow men inside of the truck and I got so mad. <laughs> Let the marshmallows die. <laughs> Use them as your test subjects. I don't care. That was a good use for them. But let them stay inside of the fucking glass. You don't need them every other scene. They do, they do not bother me that much. Uh, but I definitely do see them becoming a little too minion-ish. Uh, I do definitely do agree with you on that. Because, like, it's one of those things where you know they're introduced to sell merchandise. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure you can find, like, uh... uh uh, plushies of it, or maybe like little keychains of it. Little stress ball. The little spoon, maybe a little stress ball of them. Like it, it's definitely something that was introduced to to, to sell merchandise, um, and uh, I definitely do agree with you. Uh, I think they introduced them like um, a, a few times to the movie where it didn't really need it. Like um, it, like in in the end, um, they have the. Uh, they introduce a new, um, another new piece of technology This uh, in this movie. Last movie, we had uh, an RC car that was fitted with a ghost trap. Um, and this movie, we actually have a drone that's fitted with a ghost trap. Uh, and in this movie, when they uh, successfully uh, hold back uh, this movie's villain, um, they try to use the, the drone ghost trap to, uh, to trap him. And then the Stay Puft guys like come in and like they 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 mess up the uh the trap a little bit and he ends up get, getting getting uh, getting trapped later on but like it's 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 one of those things where it, it was introduced to build uh, to build a little tension like oh no they're not gonna trap him but, like in the end you know they're gonna trap him for one and also that really didn't need didn't really need to be there you see my problem with it was first of all. We have no reason to believe that they got free. 
No. They, they never showed us that it wasn't a part of the movie. Second of all, they didn't do anything to the trap. They were a, like an audience that just popped up around Finn Wolfhard while he was trying to drive this drone. Oh. The trap got destroyed by the big bad swinging his hand at it. That, that's what I mean. Yeah, uh, um, and I think it was actually Podcast who was... Uh, was it Podcast? It, was it podcast. might have been Podcast. Sorry um, about that. No, that's right. Uh, uh, I know the difference between Podcast and Finn Wolfhard, I <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah the, um, the the Stay Puft guys don't the little Stay Puft guys don't really mess with the trap itself. Uh, it's remote controlled, of course, um, but the, they mess with Podcast uh, when he's trying to to pilot the drone over to to, to trap this movie's villain. Um, and uh, that's more uh, uh, what I mean. They don't really need to be there to add extra tension. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying too. Is it's just yeah. they didn't do anything. They were just there to remind you that they exist. Yeah. And like in the end, this is kind of a family movie. Like, like you know, in the end, that the the the, the, the movie's villain's gonna get trapped. Like, we didn't really need them to be there to, to add a little bit of extra tension of like, oh no, they, they, they messed them up. You can't pilot the drone. Oh, I totally saw that coming though because they made this big deal earlier when they were explaining how the traps work, and they said, oh yeah, this uh the storage that we have is basically just a really big version of the ghost traps. And so when the big bat is coming in, he splits open the floor and you can see some light coming through from the goat, the um, ghost storage unit. And so I said, oh, he's going to get trapped in the unit instead of an actual trap because he's too big. Yeah. So I was fully prepared for that one. Yeah. I just don't see why the marshmallow guys had to be there. No, they, they really didn't have to be there. Again, they didn't really bother me as much as they did Ash. Um, but I definitely do agree that that they were in some scenes where they didn't really need to be in. And honestly, though, like um, like you said, they weren't really a character that needed to be brought over into this into this movie. Um, but again, overall, the movie was very good. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I love myself a cute, marketable character. I just want them to actually make sense with the plot in the bare minimum way. Yeah, not just introduced for no reason. Exactly. But, again, overall, the movie was fantastic. It was so funny and just entertaining. The time just flew by. There was so much that happened in so much of this world that they have expanded on, and it was all wonderful. And it, again, it, it was such a magical feeling that it didn't feel overwhelming in any way. Especially because they basically had, like, eight main characters, nine main characters in the final fight scene. Yeah. That is impressive that they juggled all of that better than Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but what would you give uh, the, this movie? Yeah. I'm giving rating? this a solid four. Solid four. Absolutely, yeah. as far as filmmaking goes, visual effects in particular. Yes. Absolutely incredible. They did a really great job, and I think they did a really good job of um, tying all the loose ends together from the things that they mentioned in the beginning. Yeah. Everything they set up, they followed through, and I really appreciated it. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's a, definitely a, a, a solid four. It was a fun movie. It was a nice continuation of um, of the story. Uh, and a little bit about the effects. They actually uh, use a lot of the same effects that were kind of used in the first one. And like the, like for, for, for Slimer, they actually have a suit uh, for, uh, for Slimer. Um, they have a guy in his suit for some of the shots. Of course, some of them are, are, are CGI, of course. Um, but uh, a lot of the effects are, are practical like they were in the, uh, in the first one. Which is part of what gives it its charm. But in that blend of the CG and the practical effects is what makes it so good. Yeah. And so I really appreciate getting to see this so well done in something where it would be so easy to say, let's just make all the ghosts CG. And I would ask if it was scary, but obviously it wasn't really that scary. It wasn't meant to be scary. I appreciated scary. some good tension when we got that villain reveal, though, because he looked so good. 
good. Yes, the, the, the villain, they do a very good job of making the villain very, feel very ominous. Yeah, and all the icicles jutting out of the ground and, like, you don't see anyone speared on them, but you feel like there are people who are speared on you, them. You know that there's a couple who got Which kebobbed. I think is the line that they have to tread for a PG-13 movie like this, but I loved it. Yeah. It was I think great. it was all incredibly well done. But that's it for uh, for us here on uh, Real Scary. Uh, we will see you in the next movie.